Yay. Thank you. Uh, all of that was true. I'm Mike Alger, and I'm here to talk about UX design for headset displays. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to read a lot, and so I'm going to be kind of just doing this because I'm really bad at ad-libbing. So uh, the presentation starts out slow, but by the end, you'll probably be like, wow, that was too much information for one talk. Uh, right now, headset displays mostly means virtual reality, but being a designer in this space includes understanding augmented reality, XR, and whatever other catchy terms people want to call their thing. But for the sake of this presentation, I'm just going to refer to all tracked headsets as VR. This presentation also has some stuff presented by these guys before. Uh, since this is a design conference, I've aggregated some of their topics and organized it as kind of a grab bag fire hose loosely tied together with a storyline. So you as designers can see a lot of angles about how we design for VR. So we'll go through what users have said that they're looking for, who to look for to get on your team, and what skills you'll want, what kind of prototyping you'll want to do together, some of the basics for ergonomics and design in headsets, and then some examples of our process on some daydream interfaces. So first, we start with user needs. Our research team, led by David Dearman at the time, did a big survey to find people who had bought a mobile VR headset and asked them questions about what their reason was, what they expected from VR, and how often and where they're currently using them. They boiled the results down from that to some tips about what people want to do and how they want to do it. So people are, are expecting completely new things and not just rehashes of current things. Users of VR are actually a lot more open to completely different interfaces than they've ever seen before. They're willing to figure out a UI that they've never seen uh, because there's not an expectation for how it works. Like we've already learned how to use a smartphone, PC, or car dashboard. So it's okay to totally invent new genres. When they asked people why they chose to get a mobile, mobile VR headset, some of the most common answers were to try something new, play games, watch movies, and increase my productivity, which was kind of a surprising one. Games are only one part of VR, and its real power, in my opinion, is in making it a useful tool for people. So we also asked about how they're currently using them. The biggest surprise was that people aren't typically having short snackable sessions. Uh, we think of a mobile phone as quick snacking experiences, like when you check a sports score or text a friend to see if they want to meet up. VR is more like a book because it can maintain people's attention for a lot longer. Session length is really about the content. People want to and are using these headsets for more than 30 minutes at a time sometimes several hours if the content is there. And then, even though this study was on mobile VR and the headsets are portable, what most users showed us was that they mostly use them in their house or some other safe place like a friend's house or a hotel room. Some of the researchers went to see for themselves actually how users were really using them, and people typically showed them that they had a comfy spot like a favorite chair or a couch or a bed that they'd use. Standing gets tiring really quickly and most of the experiences you build people will use seated. So remember that session lengths are long and you probably won't want to stand for an hour. You'll also notice that it's not very easy to turn all the way around if you're sitting on a couch. So knowing that people want new, long, comfortable experiences how do we put together a team to make that product? Designing for VR is different from other mediums, but there's a ton of transferable skills. And smart people will be able and eager realistically to adapt. There was a time when web design was new and print designers learned new digital skill sets. Then later, 
web designers learned how to adjust their canvas for mobile design. With print, web, or mobile, we spend most of our time designing flat things. For VR, we have visuals, sound, and motion like mobile, but we also have a world with environments, light, and shadows. UI is just a component of this world. Uh, a guy on our team named Anshaman put together these recommendations for putting together a VR team. In VR design right now, no one's just an interaction designer or just a 3D artist. Instead, you'll find an interaction designer who's also good with 3D or a prototyper who also knows motion design. The tech and practices are obviously advancing as we go, so the best way to keep up is working together and sharing and learning from each other. You definitely have to bounce ideas off each other. It's rare to hear someone say that's someone else's job, it's not mine. They're willing to get out of their comfort zone and learn new skills. So it's not just about what you've learned in the past, but also what you're in the middle of learning right now. So what kinds of skills are we talking about? These are some of the most common ones for VR designers. Each tends to have a little twist on how you apply it in this medium. For example, interaction design has to consider spatial organization and hierarchy and use game engines to create layouts. For visual design, the concepts of grids and typography can change just a little bit because text can exist at different Z depths. Uh, when you're just starting out and prototyping, you'd be okay to find some people with just these skills. With a couple of people to bounce ideas off of, you can build and refine some quick prototypes, then add the rest as you go because they're important for a final product. These are the people that make just quick random prototypes to see what's good. If you're one of these prototypers, then it's your job to find good, simple interactions that become the core mechanics of your final product. So if you happen to be a project manager, where do you find these people? Well, besides this room, obviously, game designers have great 3D and game engine skills, and VR has to have super high frame rates, and these people know how to do that. Visual effects artists are also great at 3D. They understand stereoscopy and know the tricks to make things look good. For designers with web and mobile backgrounds, designing information and creating fine, meaningful interactions is their bread and butter. This is probably a lot of people here. So learning to apply your visual design and JavaScript skills to Unity would be a great way to get started as a VR prototyper. And lots of students are working on VR projects at different design schools around the world. The truth is that this medium has so little done in it that people just out of school have about as much experience as anybody. Hackathons and game jams also are a good place to meet people uh, because you can see how they work really quickly and you know pretty quickly if you want to work with them again. Realistically, most of the people here aren't managers putting together a team, so if you are the designers adopting your existing skills, then I'd say use a headset and try out as many VR apps as you can. You'll start to get an eye for the nuances of the design and build your chops for what works and what doesn't. And when you go to make things, then here's the next skills for you. You'll need to know just one tool from each of these categories. The good news is, if you're a designer, then you already know something from the last one. Between the remaining two, a uh, game engine is good to start with. Unity and Unreal are free, and there's tons of free online tutorials. Just like when you learned Illustrator or HTML or whatever you know now, it's annoying through the learning curve, but after you've learned the tool, you can focus on what to create and not how to create it. So then, as you're learning the skills, and you've got your team put together that's doing the same, you'll be in the stage of prototyping. There's a team called Daydream Labs whose whole job is to make a bunch of prototypes. You can see they're just quick explorations and they've made stuff for different platforms like Cardboard, AR Core, Daydream, and Vive. So this is where you perk up and go, oh, this is way cooler. Uh, why was he spending so much time talking on all those slides with just text and images? Yeah, 
prototyping is where you get to really try all the weird stuff that makes working in VR fun. You'll see that lots of things that you start out with are literal, physical interactions. It's a 3D spatial medium. This is also where you'll see that there's no sure, definite way to do something. Like on a phone, you know how to the user is going to push a button every time. They tap it with their finger. On a computer, the user puts their cursor over a button and clicks. But here, there's not really one way to press a button. They could shoot it with a laser. They could physically collide their hand into the button and push it. They could put their hand inside of the button and pull the trigger. They could look at the button for three seconds and then it act activates automatically. So you'll have to f have fun for a while just trying out these crazy interactions, but eventually you'll be like, listen, this stuff is way super fun, but I need some structure for some of the basics at least. Well, for one, you should check out the recorded talks from Daydream Labs because they go through some of their learning. But for the basics of interaction design, I think interactions with controllers mostly fall into three categories, which I have illustrated so very beautifully here. Volumetric is where you have to literally physically collide with it. Ray is where you point at it like a laser and abstracted is when the input isn't physically connected to its source so like when you move your mouse away from you on the desk and the cursor on the screen moves up with a vr controller you might do something like swipe on the controller's touchpad to move a cursor so we could talk about examples of these in terms of keyboards for text entry volumetric is where you would play the keyboard like a drum set Ray interaction has you shoot the keys with pointers at a distance. It's less fun, but it's faster and less tiring. And then abstracted is hard to describe again, but Steam VR has a version of their keyboard like this where you can put your fingers on the controller's touchpads, and wherever your fingers are, you see the dots on the big keyboard surface. So you slide your thumbs around and click buttons down, kind of like texting on a phone. Since people wanted to know what some of the basic best practices were, some of our UX team made an app called Daydream Elements that shows a bunch of recommendable interactions. You can see here that uh, there's some ways to rotate and teleport around without feeling discomfort. Uh, it really is your ethical responsibility as a designer to not make people feel ill. That's not really the case with pretty much any other kind of UI design. You'll see that they've also got examples of radial menus. One of them is like a click and drag kind, another is just a swipe menu on the touchpad. And there's a constellation style menu, which is pretty cool. So check that app out and try them and see what you think. With all these interactions, we want to recognize that just because you can do something crazy doesn't mean that it's the right design choice. For example, making text 3D doesn't make it more understandable. It's more eye-catching, but it's not as quickly communicative. Same goes for icons. You can recognize them faster in 2D than you can in 3D. So some things are just better if they stay flat. But things that are naturally 3D should probably be shown that way. This is an MRI of someone's head that I know. It can be hard to tell what's going on because it's a 3D thing, but we're only seeing one 2D slice at a time. But I took the frames from that video and laid them on top of each other, and you can see how it's significantly more understandable. You can still look at all the 2D slices, but you can do some extra things like cut into all of them at once and understand how the structures relate to each other. It's something that's significantly more understandable in 3D than 2D, because it's an originally volumetric concept. Architectural blueprints would be another example of a 3D thing trying to be represented in 2D, as would mechanical schematics, educational cross-sections, or terrain and maps. Ski maps aren't particularly good at communicating how steep a run is. And then there's abstract concepts that can be either 2 or 3D, like data visualization. In some sense, all of these things are technically data visualization, 
But what I mean is that something like a calendar with weeks is kind of made up. It's a system of cycles that continue forever in either direction. So maybe a calendar can be redesigned to be more communicative in 3D, like maybe if we put the cycles within cycles in a helix or something. That's the kind of question that you'd want to answer and make an interaction design prototype for in that prototyping stage. So the sections so far were that you know what people are looking for, you've got a team started, and you're ready to start prototyping. Then you're going to want to lay things out in VR. So rather than rediscovering the same things everyone else has, I can help you with my opinion on layout guidelines. This part has some stuff that gets a little bit heavy on angles and numbers and math. Uh, when you put an interface uh, anywhere around someone, it can be tough to narrow it down to where. So constraints can be nice to use as starting points. The limits of your body is one of those constraints to start with. Digital designers are used to thinking about how the eye is guided through things or how the thumb can reach where on a device like a phone, for example. For VR, remember that people were using these on their bed or couch a lot of the time. When you're designing for headset displays, you can think about how someone's moving their head, how much of the scene they can see, and how far away things are. In 2D, we work with an artboard or canvas. You can think about how much they move as your new canvas boundaries. If you've designed your experience to be a standing one instead of seated, they can go all the way around, they just can't see a certain amount at a time. What they see kind of looks like a cone from the side, but if we look at it from their point of view, it's a circle. If you have a UI panel covering more than 70 degrees of that field of view, or 35 to each side, it starts to feel like the theater screen is as much as you could even look at. For reference, an IMAX screen from the middle seat is 70 degrees. This is the part where we get into those numbers. If the user's sitting in a stationary chair like their couch, there's boundaries to how far they'll comfortably move their neck. They can easily see all the way to 80 degrees to each side, and 30 is kind of a comfortable center point, left and right. If you really stretch, then you can put stuff further, but remember that they'll have to strain their neck or change their posture and turn their shoulders if it's too far and they're on a couch. Vertically, you tend to look down a little, like 15 degrees from the horizon, but it depends more on your posture. So with those constraints, you've got a field of view and a range of motion. And that's one way to think about what your canvas is. Things can be placed all over the range of motion, but the user will only be able to see what's in their field of view at a time. And remember that this is actually a 3D guide. So it's more like this kind of shape, where things can be placed at any of those angles or depths. And you know that there's kind of an order to where you look first on something like a newspaper or web page. I think that the order of looking in headsets goes like this. Front and center first, then side second, then down. And people have to be really looking for answers to look up at the sky. And that weird bean thing is me saying that whatever controllers they have uh, that they're holding is the last place that they tend to look. So that can help you organize information based on what's most important in your hierarchy. We also add depth to our interface. Things can be put close or far. Too close in like a half meter for too long is uncomfortable and feels like it's up in your face and you get cross-eyed. Too far, on the other hand, past 20 meters, you can't really see the difference in depth very easily. You can still kind of see it, but it's not very clear to your brain how much separation there is. So most of your main content UI stuff will fall within this zone here where depth is still meaningful and comfortable to see. Anecdotally, we've also noticed that shadows and imperfections in the texture are really important. So if you have subtle noise in your textures and represent light realistically, it'll really help give your users more cues to understand depth in the way that their brains are wired to automatically. 
The reason is that the imperfections give your eyes something to converge on. Without them, a large flat color might look like an infinite void of that color because every pixel shows up the same, so your brain can't see those details to tell how far away something is. So basically, you add back in those specks and a little bit of noise to make it make more sense to your brain. Resolution is also a major constraint. We kind of estimate pixels per degree. By approximating how many pixels on the screen fit in one degree of your field of view near the center. They're not exactly square because they're usually more like mobile phone screens, but we'll just represent it as square here. That low resolution has a couple major consequences that affect our design process. One of those is this problem where aliasing makes hard edges and thin lines kind of sparkle like this. You can use anti-aliasing to reduce it, but turning that up too high hurts your performance. So the way to get around this is we try to avoid high contrast edges and thin lines in our visual designs. That low resolution also affects text readability. You might have great or poor vision in real life, but in VR, everyone's tapped by the device's pixels per degree. It's a lot like having worse vision just in general. If there's a road sign that's in the distance and you can't read it, there's two solutions. You can decrease the distance to the sign, or you can make the sign bigger. At every distance, there's a minimum text size that's readable, and that scales linearly based on its distance to you. To find out what that is, we did another user study to see what the minimum readable sizes were for VR. We'd have the text start small, and then the user would increase it until it was just barely readable without guessing. Then we'd ask them to increase it until it was comfortable, and we'd record both of those values. They tested different people, headsets, and contrast ratios with dark on light and light on dark. And what we found was that you can estimate what the minimum text size is for headsets based on their pixels per degree. It's important for us as designers because everything in your layout is going to stem from the text size. And just like you'd think, as pixels per degree increases, your text can be smaller. There's barely readable and there's comfortably readable. Right now, your starting point is about 1.5 degrees of the field of view. Of course, it'll be smaller later as companies smash more pixels in and VR approaches 2020 vision, which is the end of this graph. You can see that we get major gains in the near term, though. The text will get smaller faster over the first few generations. So the numbers I suggest are that the text needs to be more than more than 14 pixels tall on the display before your brain can even tell what letters they're making, and around 20 pixels tall is comfortable. Different contrast ratios, optics, rendering methods, font weights, and typefaces will all be a little different, but saying 20 pixels tall is an easy way to give a ballpark baseline for us as designers to start with. So I put that into the field of view and the range of motion, and that gives us a basic text size and a basic canvas. Uh, these numbers are pretty conservative and rounded because the purpose is to give you as designers a baseline for VR. It's like when you open a new document and you have a default paper dimensions and font size. This is your basic template. So you'll want to consider whether to put content on flat, faceted, or curved planes. Those folds can separate content nicely, but a curve feels futuristic and sleek. And then you'll also want to consider whether your app is the kind that might be used standing or laying down and what that means for placement. You might be tempted to just design a flat thing, but that would be sad and boring. Uh, you might also be tempted to go overboard and put depth where it's not meaningful or useful. This is like the VR design equivalent of the 3D movie where they stick their hand out towards you like 3D. Uh, instead, start with what m where you might put things in a 2D UI that would suggest depth anyway. S drop shadows, gradients, bevels, and borders are places where you would suggest depth in 2D that you can actually 
literally have different depths in VR. So think about skeuomorphism versus minimalism. Only use properties of design that serve the user understanding first and branding of the client second. As an example of those concepts, here's a thing I made that tries to use these layers of depth in a UI. It's the dashboard that a user can pull up from anywhere in VR. The app that they're using blurs and moves to the background and this menu comes up. Choices for information hierarchy are based on what we thought would be most important. And you can see how I tried to use depth not in any crazy way, but to suggest hierarchy and spatial affordances. Elements don't stray too far from the plane of convergence where the user's eyes are focused. Depth comes from other elements so that this relationship is shown to each of them. And I also tried this peg in a hole style for radio buttons as an affordance that you have one peg and you can only choose one of the three holes to put it in. Some of the things about the actual implementation of this dashboard design have changed since this motion exploration. Another design example is the interface of Daydream Home that Michael Ishigaki and others went through on our team. Uh, this was the design process for that and the learnings that he presented about Daydream Home. Like everyone, they started out with the tools familiar to them. In their case, Sketch and Photoshop. But making a design like this and sticking it in usually looked flat, boring, and like it was sized weird. They realized the process that they were used to just wouldn't really work. So they started trying stuff in VR first, so it felt native to the platform. The designs were more interesting and felt more right for the medium. This is, is a suggestion that you'll see from pretty much every VR designer, is that laying stuff out with basic shapes in VR is always a better starting point. By doing VR sooner, they could also catch stuff like this, where they were thinking that they could put tooltips on stuff. But when you put it in VR and stuff intersecting, um, it doesn't really work so well. So you have to do some interesting things there and design it differently. So get your designs into VR as soon as possible, and you'll catch those kinds of things sooner. I'll explain how they implemented that for the Daydream Home design. Here's a diagram of their flow. You'll notice that interaction design is there the whole time because prototyping was the only way to prove out an interaction right now. And this might be different for you. The feedback loop that they had was that they had to prototype stuff in VR to answer their questions or solve problems. So every time there was a maybe this, then they had to prove it with a prototype. So at this first stage of design, it's the same sort of basic organization that you normally think of with the design process. You start with information architecture. What are the goals of the user? What should be there right away? What's behind interactions and so on? Then another familiar one is sketching out ideas. Like I said, they tried creating mockups with applications like Photoshop, but they found it was easy enough just to draw out their ideas with pen and paper. And then they start putting it in VR. You just put basic shapes in your game engine and check them out in the headset. It gives you a sense of how your design plays out spatially. Then they started adding UI stuff like text, images, and interactive elements. Again, they keep looking at it in VR, which showed them that the text was actually too small because there's not enough space on the posters. This was before we had done that text study, so they were all just doing guess and check at this point. So they tried more with positioning in Z space to see if that helped. Putting it around a cylinder seems like it'll be a pretty standard UI thing for VR, but it didn't quite fix the text thing in this case yet though, so their next iteration they had to put fewer on these cards, or put fewer of these cards so that there was more space for readable text. So here's where they started putting better looking filler content. You can see they've added obvious big filler images, and then there's an icon asset on the ones underneath. But you can also see they added pagination dots and a button down there below. And you can see it's not in a room anymore, so they were transitioning to open spaces. And this is where they started involving user testing. That's to avoid the classic thing 
where you look at it over and over and you think it's good the whole time, but then you give it to someone else, they don't know how to use it. Research put the stuff into people's hands early so that they can see how they think it works. Meanwhile, the environment designer started working with the space surrounding the UI. So here's that when it's first being incorporated. They kept the environment pretty separate from the UI. But you can definitely work on it to be more integrated, skeuomorphic, or diegetic if you want. Now that they had the dimensions for those UI elements, they could actually start making the assets. So they start making the final 3D models and 2D textures that'll go on them. One of the main points of the UI was to take people to other places. So they thought that it could be more like windows into other worlds. But when they tried it in the headset, it was all weird and distracting to have a bunch of portals next to each other. Uh, it increases what we frequently refer to as cognitive load to have really weird depth conflicts all over the place. So then they tried these layers of flat textures that you can expand out on hover and then sandwich back together. So after they prototyped this one, they really liked it. It also tilts a little bit on the corners as you hover on it. So this is when they started actually handing off their prototypes to be built for real. The motion designer started iterating on animations. They thought of a wind metaphor for motion to tie the UI, environment, and animation together. I think they wanted to avoid having obvious border lines, so when it scrolls, things can't really disappear across an edge. So I think this version specifically is maybe a little too poppy and draws attention to the last one more than others, but that's the whole point of iterating. So they're going along, getting good at lighting materials, still checking out stuff in VR all the time, and they've got the visual assets done and are tweaking motion and sound. Here's one where they're incorporating the audio design and motion with lighting. Even without a reticle or laser or anything, it's pretty clear what's going on here and that it's doing this hover where if you click, this is the thing that's coming to you. Hovering stuff in Z-depth towards the user is a pretty common VR UI thing that you can do. And so near the end, where it shipped in its first version, there's little, little tweaks and things that bring it all together, and it starts looking like a real thing. And finally, it's all those little changes and polish that make it nice. So having that VR-first process helped them progress quickly, and they used all those skill sets I mentioned earlier along the way, so they could look at it in a headset as frequently as possible. Looking again at my dashboard project from last year, I wanted to also point out how I would actually define and hand this stuff off to engineers if that's your flow. So you can see I did these red line measurements to define sizes and spacing as you might normally do, but I also needed to do things like isometric or side views to define depth so that it doesn't just all end up as one flat surface. And then I'd also do that for motion design too, like you see here. So that specific workflow won't be applicable to all apps, but hopefully sharing this was helpful for you to see how you can apply it to whatever you're making. And that's whether you're laying out a medical imaging viewer, a living model train town, conversational story with an AI NPC, volumetric financial analysis software, psychological choose-your-own-adventure, audio and music mixing studio, fantasy VR MMORPG, visual programming node system, some kind of new documentary storytelling methods, or whatever. Insert your awesome idea here. These suggestions can help you hit the ground running. And you can start by understanding that people want long-form, seated content with stories they've never seen before. Then you can build a collaborative team with a wide range of skill sets to help you make it. You'll start by prototyping for 3D interaction to find what mechanics you're going to rely on. Then as you're building, 
you now have some useful numbers to start with so that your users won't have to strain when they're trying to turn to see something or they won't have to squint to try to read something. And finally, you know to use it in VR throughout the whole process so you'll build a natural interface that's native to the medium. So that was a ton of stuff and I went through a lot faster than I thought I was going to, <laughs> but I hope that it helps you understand how we apply design processes all the way from research through implementation when shipping an interface for headset displays. So uh, if you have any questions, I think that there's going to be plenty of time for them. Um, and think of them now. Thank you so much.